Hey, this is Wally, and you're listening to the Young Justice Files on the Whelmed podcast, or whatever. Whelmed? Dick, did you make him say that? Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-1-2. Hello team, welcome to Scream Something. My name is Rich and I'm here with my co-host Emily. Hey everybody, in Scream Something, Rich and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions and general incoherent screaming uh, for the episodes of season three that were released last Friday. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, we promise, but we'll be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned for after the mid-season finale. So, you know, after this one... Please! I lost one, Mom! I can't lose you, too! Okay, Patrol! Spell it out! P-I-E-P-I-E-P-I-E Let's die! Not gonna make it. And with all that out of the way, let's dive in. Hello, Megan. The titles for this week's episode for our mid-season finale were Exceptional Human Beings, Another Freak, Nightmare Monkeys, and True Heroes. They were released on January 25th, 2019. The in-episode dates covered October 12th through November 1st. The directors were Christopher Berkeley, Mel Zwire, Vinton Hugh, which is what we're still going with. I think we're still going with that. Okay. <laughs> Someone correct us if we're wrong. Uh, Sorry, come baby. on the show and correct us if we're wrong. <laughs> uh, and Christopher Berkeley, again, who directed two episodes in this segment of them. Uh, then for writers, we've got Francisco Paredes, uh, May Cat, Greg Weissman, and Kevin Hopps. Just in time for your next mission. In episode 10, we open with Batman, Katana, and Metamorpho arriving on Santa Prisca to get some intel on the League of Shadows, who are apparently operating out of there now. While over in Detroit, we meet for the first time Victor Stone, whose dad works for Star Labs and who we'll be seeing a bit more of later. Uh, the Outsiders <laughs> do some training. Uh, We're going to see a lot more of him later. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe. Possibly. He's just mm. a cameo. He's in there for no reason. <laughs> mm. The, meanwhile, the Outsiders do some more training, Halo and Brion do some more flirting, and Nightwing has to have yet another conversation with Brion about patience and trust. It's almost like he's got a theme this season. Uh, on Santa Prisca, Batman overhears a conversation between Lady Shiva, Deathstroke, and Cassandra Savage, <laughs> so many characters, that reveals that Tara Markov was part of the League of Shadows, but apparently washed out of the program recently. In Star City, Artemis registers Violet for school, and Cheshire pays Will Harper a visit that absolutely breaks my heart. <laughs> dead. Emily's dead. <laughs> Emily's very dead, guys. Emotional roller coaster this week. Neil and I were watching this episode together, and we just looked at each other and we're going, Yeah, Emily's dead. <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple of moments. <laughs> but... Back on Santa Prisca, Batman's team faces off against Bane, Lady Shiva, and Deathstroke, and the fight ends when Oracle remotely flies the Batwing, it appears, because that's a thing, uh, mm -hmm. in to bail him out of the situation. And in Detroit, we see Victor Stone win his football game while his dad is given a new Genesis father box to study. By the most haggard-looking Hal Jordan I have ever seen in animation. <laughs> He's having a day. He's, he's having a, a day. rough day. Neil turned to me and he's like, is that how? He looks terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Look, he looks rough. Rough. Get your hair combed, buddy. Yikes. Lily's anyway. has been a bit busy. <laughs> he's all, I got this father box. <laughs> uh, it was a long trip. <laughs> but oh, on to man. the next episode. <laughs> Sorry. Nod to hell. Get some rest, buddy. <laughs> Episode 11 opens with Victor storming into his dad's lab. Oh, God, this whole scene. They get into a fight about Dr. Stone's distant parenting and Victor's future, which is cut short by the anti-meta device that he's been studying exploding. Dad, 
Oh. Uh, no, in don't, in Rich. <clears throat> don't. Oh, I was God. hurt enough. It was so bad. It was so hard. My favorite line, I think, in all of this first half season is, I'm not a kid trying to get you to eat my mud pie. <laughs> this is my life. <laughs> what a great- God. That whole fight. We'll get into it. We'll get into it. <laughs> we'll get into, we it. get into it. We're getting off track. Just, just nod to Zeno for delivering that line. It's brilliant. In Happy Harbor, it's the first day of school for Violet and Forager, now wearing a glamour charm from Zatanna and going by Fred Bug with two G's, <laughs> where they meet Harper Rowe. In Detroit, Victor's been mortally wounded by the explosion, but his father uses the father box to heal him, and the apocalypse tech fuses with him and generates robotic prosthetics. To keep Victor alive, everything will be fine. It's fine. After, nothing bad after, could come from that. Nothing could possibly happen. <laughs> when Steel tells you something's evil, listen. After waking up, Victor flies into a murderous rage. <laughs> oh, wait. Everything's not okay. Oh, really? And tries to kill his father, something that Halo seems to sense because she opens a boom tube <laughs> that leads directly to him. After a fight between the two, Halo cleanses Victor of the father box's control, and he travels with her back to Happy Harbor. And finally, Brion and Dick reconcile after their earlier driveway fight. That we glossed over. Fin- we did, uh, as the prince finally seems ready to move forward and deal with his issues. I think he's ready to move on because this is the first time Dick fought back and he just fl- floored him. <laughs> it's a real good fight scene in he's the like, rain oh, outside. You- oh, it's good. Oh, you, oh, you want to fight? Here's a palm to the chest. Have a seat. <laughs> it was so good. We'll it get into good. it. We'll get into yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> we got to condense. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Four episodes. On to episode 12. So episode 12 opens with Garfield Logan, formerly Beast Boy, filming an episode of his TV show, Space Trek 3016, everybody's favorite sci-fi teen show, I guess, uh, where we see him chatting with Gretchen Good. A lot happens there that we don't have time to explain <laughs> right now. <laughs> so many new characters. This- <laughs> Scream something, volume four. A lot's happening. <laughs> a lot on. happens and we don't have time. So, <laughs> and over in Happy Harbor, Victor Stone gets introduced to our core cast and they piece together Halo's backstory along the way. She's actually the soul of a mother box merged with Gabrielle Dow's body. Yep. <laughs> That's a thing. That's a thing. Uh, out in Beverly Hills, Garfield tries on a pair of good goggles before his date with Queen Perdita and the goggles being totally evil, try to mind control him. But instead of working as directed, Garfield basically starts hallucinating about all of his past trauma in what can only be described as a heartbreaking fever dream. (laughs) That includes a whole Doom Patrol Go segment that's just a lot to unpack. (laughs) Spell it out, team. D-I-E. We'll get into it. God. But to sum up, after Garfield's mom died, he apparently started living with the Doom Patrol. But after they were killed on a mission, McGann gained custody of him, only to lose it to Rita Farr's husband, Steve Dayton. Stephen Dayton. Yeah. We get some Hello Megan stuff. Some more trauma flashbacks are and are eventually informed that Beast Boy's powers may in fact come from a monkey god. <laughs> And outside of that, (laughs) Perdita calls Miss Martian to assist with the incapacitated Beast Boy situation, and she enters his mind, but he's apparently figured out how to save himself at that point and has decided to become a superhero again. Yes. For an episode that almost entirely takes place in one room, a lot happens. Uh, (laughs) And to round out the episode, we get three kisses at the very end, Queen Perdita and Garfield, Connor and McGann, and Brion and Violet, who are officially a thing. Woot woot, woot woot. That was another moment we were like, oh, Emily. (laughs) All right, here we go. Rolling from that fever dream into episode 13, the Outsiders plan to go to the Happy Harbor High Halloween dance, but it's interrupted by Nightwing having a lead on Tara's actual location. They're headed to, yes, Greater Bialya, and I have a lot to say about that, in the bioship to rescue Tara from one of the many metahuman trading posts that the good goggles have apparently been mind-controlling and directing potential metateens to. 
However, it turns out this place isn't just a depot, it's also a metahuman fight club and auction house guarded by Queen Bee's squad of metahuman villains. So much. Just a deep sigh. Artemis, Black Lightning, and Brion are able to sneak in and get Halo out safely. In Happy Harbor, Helga Jace has to calm Halo down from a Brion-related panic attack, and Victor's father box senses Halo's current defenselessness, and the whole episode turns into a horror movie. While Halo <laughs> tries to grapple with her new human emotions, she also successfully cleanses Victor of the father box's control, uh, this time permanently. Back in Greater Bialya, the team has to go back in to rescue the rest of the medikids being held there. A fight breaks out, as usual, but with a little help from Brion and Terra, they're able to get everyone out safely. And with Nightwing declaring that the outsiders might just be ready for the team, all seems well. Until we cut to the next morning in Star City, where Princess Tara texts Deathstroke that she's, quote, in. And then we scream for a while. Next four months, at least. Yep. It's a month. A few months. So I have Whew. no aster from these episodes. There's nothing to talk about. Clearly, these were all just filler. <clears throat> yep. <laughs> it's not much. Can't even say it with a straight face. Yeah. Oh, God. Just there isn't it. There isn't at all like eight background characters with deep cuts into crazy ancient DC history at all. I'm looking at you, Maycat. So much happens. <sighs> okay. Uh, before we move on to the next thing, I will say, before we went move on to Raster, I will say this, just to reiterate, in case you're jumping in on our Scream Something, Something episodes and have not yet heard what we're going to be doing. Yes, these are overviews of these episodes. <laughs> we'll have a few weeks after this week where we'll have some discussion sessions as Emily and I get prepared to do deep dives on each individual episode. So we cannot possibly cover everything in an hour <laughs> that happens in these four episodes, Trust us, we'll get to it. And if you thought those those summaries of episodes were real brief and we skipped over a lot, you're right, we did. Horror movie. Okay. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's get on to the Saster, quick. Dipper boy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the Aster. Uh, you want me to start? Come out, come out, whatever you no! are. <laughs> Let me just blow out my audio. Here's Victor. No. <laughs> I was like, what is happening right now? I'm, I'm just screaming oh. forever. Do you, oh, okay. Would you like me to start with my Aster? Yeah. Why don't, you, why don't you start? I'm just stuck on. I'm not even sure I can mention my first Aster. Uh, <laughs> consider, right. like, we're a family friendly show. Oh, yeah. That was another moment that killed you. I'll start off because I feel like I got to mention it. I'm saying nothing. That first scene with McGann and Connor in our first episode from this week killed me. And I had to make sure I didn't shriek too loud because that sure was, sure was a that scene. That was a thing. That sure was a scene that you couldn't have on Cartoon Network. <laughs> bye bye, Cartoon Network. She's they were wearing, just hanging out. They were just hanging out at home. Yeah, she's just wearing her engagement ring. It's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, on to the next section. <laughs> on to the next. I had to call it out. I was like, "No, you do. It's what good. Is We're good. Here. <laughs> We're good." Okay, so moving on <laughs> to something that is less absolutely killing me. Uh, there's a moment on Santa Prisca where Batman calls out the fact that like half the team and several villains have all gotten onto Santa Prisca without Bane knowing when Bane's like, nobody gets onto my island without my knowledge. And Batman's like, except lists 20 people. And I just started laughing. I was like, that's Robin, perfect. Kid Flash, Aqualad, Superboy. Cult of Cobra. <laughs> the cult of the cobra. Sportsman. Sportsmaster. Somebody did a... God, I wish I could find it. Somebody did a YouTube thing where they just showed that scene. And every time every time Batman said a name, they put like a pop-up in the corner showing, showing them on Santa Prisca. It was really funny. That's perfect. That's it was all these cuts from Drop Zone. Every, they're like, nobody can get here. <laughs> Everyone can get here. A bunch right, of teenagers yeah, no, got it's, here. It's a, it's a revolving door, dude. Just. <laughs> but the other thing from that episode that absolutely broke me and was one of the, oh, no, they've killed Emily scenes is the scene. There's only like six of them. 
<laughs> There's only like six across four episodes. Six six deaths. Six Emily deaths. Oh, was the incredible Cheshroy scene mm. in this episode that we t- had to gloss over like everything. And I don't even know if we can still call them Cheshroy because he's not Roy anymore. We'll see. We'll see if the fandom renames them. But that interaction between them is so good and it's so well acted. And it's just so to mini super sweethearts here for a second. It's so soft and so tender, which is so in contrast to everything we've seen with them before. Like there is there Especially is Especially Will <laughs> slash Roy. He's so calm and he's so caring and it's so clear that they care about each other in that scene and it yeah. hurts me. There's no performance. There's no confrontation. It's just him being like, come inside, say hi to your daughter. I'm not, I never kicked you out. And it yeah. breaks my heart and shows part of why Jade isn't there. She has her little moment where she's like, I couldn't handle being that. And yeah. Jade needs to examine herself and her childhood and figure out all of her problems with marriage and happy families because she has a lot there. Yeah. I just keep thinking of, of, of Will in this scene and like com- comparing and contrasting in my head between that and him on the rooftop <laughs> with Black Canary <laughs> yes. and <laughs> Green Arrow and yes. Jim and Wally and like... I was just like, wow, I think you've you figured some stuff out he did. in the last two years. He clearly did. Uh, it's so yeah. good. I have so many thoughts, and I won't say them all because I will, I will do a major breakdown, but I do want to call out real quick. I need to call out. I don't know whether it was the writers or the storyboard artists or who put it in there, but there's a moment where Roy reaches out and like just grabs her under the chin and turns her face up so that she has to look him in the eyes, and it completely broke my heart because it's so good and it's such a small thing, and I don't know who's responsible for it, but thank you for killing me. (laughs) It's real good. It's those little things that make these moments feel good and human, and I really liked and appreciated it. And I'll save the rest of my screaming for our breakdowns in a couple months. Or Super Sweethearts. Or Super Sweethearts. It's almost like I need to do a Cheshroy one. (laughs) It's almost like that's on a list. I've got a bunch of secret origins. Don't feel bad. I'm behind. There's so many characters, guys. We're doing our best. There's so many characters. There's so many ships. There's so much to talk about. Hey, we found out what McGann does. Wait. Do we know that already? Yes. We found that out in 7 to 9. Yes. No, we found that out in these ones. Uh, for sure, it was said for sure in these ones because hey, Halo refers. We knew to her that she. We, we knew that she worked. Episode. That's right. We knew that she worked at the high school. We didn't yes. know what she did yet until these we episodes. did. Yeah, that's right. And Neil called it. Neil called it that she. Was he going did to be actually. Guidance counselor. Well, because he, right. he he works at a he works at a school, so he's like, oh, she has student appointments. I bet she's a counselor. <laughs> yeah, nailed and it. It's, and it's good. It's a real. It's a real interesting choice. I want to see her there. I want to see her doing that. I know we probably won't, but I'm over here being a nerd, like. Show me these kids at their jobs. <laughs> but I also think it's really funny that like they put they sent Halo and Forager to Happy Harbor, even though Halo is apparently living in Star City right now still. And I think it's literally only so that McGann can keep an eye on them. They're like, we need to send these kids to a school where there's going to be at least one person with superpowers around to make sure that they don't blow anything up. Exactly. Yes. It's a good episode. It's so good seeing them at school. And it also, like, it's so interesting to me seeing Forager and Halo have such a different first day of school experience than Connor and McGann did in season one. Because, like, it's the same school, similar fish out of water kind of themes going on there. But, like, Connor and McGann were eventually pretty easily able to blend in. She joined the cheer squad. He's her kind of a freak, but everybody likes him because he's cute boyfriend and everybody just accepts it. Whereas Halo and Forager have a much harder time and have clearly fit into a much different group. And like that's such an interesting, like different perspective on that school and that environment. And even the fact that like it's raining this entire episode is such a good like stylistic choice to just show that parallel and show how different these two experiences are. I really liked it. It was really cool. I I loved bringing in <clears throat> Harper Rowe. Yes. And how she is oh, is so okay with us like, oh, I love these two. <laughs> when she walks away and she's like, oh, they're so weird. I love them. I love these two. Yeah. Uh, May Cat, the, the writer, was on Twitter talking about how she'd never been so seen before <laughs> because she's cat with two Ts. 
<laughs> She's like, make out with two T's, got to write Fred Bug with two G's. And I have never right. felt so seen. <laughs> right. <laughs> And then she was also talking about the whole scene where she's like, they're like, what's your name? I'm Fred Bug with two G's. My name's Violet. And then Harper Rose says Harper. And she's like, you're right. And then she's like, (laughs) what? Wait, Violet Harper. Wait, okay, start over. Like, she's like, can you imagine what I sounded like talking, saying this out loud while I was trying to write? (laughs) <laughs> I love that scene. I kept I kept expecting the teacher to interrupt them because they're just in the back of the classroom having this totally. whole thing. I loved it though. And I love and it's even just that little thing of having all of them be the kids in the back of the classroom. It's so good. They're the kids in the back of the yeah. classroom. They're the kids eating lunch on the bleachers. It's so good. It's so different. I like I love it. I want to see more of it. Yeah, it's real good. Real good. Do you have any other stuff from that episode before before I keep going, or you, uh, what, what do you want to do? Get it, before we get into the fever dream. Before we get into um, the fever dream. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you got some stuff from that episode. Oh my gosh. Uh, well, of course. I mean, Harper Row is yes. Bluebird, sporting cast character for Batman. When I first saw her, I thought she might have been Livewire. That's what I said to Neil. I said, I looked, turned to Neil. I was like, is that Livewire? And he's <laughs> like, I think so. And I and she was not like acting the, the same way. Yeah. And I was just like, I don't think that's Livewire. And then we saw the credit or heard her say Harper Row. And I was like, oh, well, it's Bluebird. What? Okay. <laughs> All right. This is where we're going. All right, then. I will say, though, um, <laughs> shout out to Zara, Zara Fuzzle. Who does the voice of Halo? Also does the voice of Cassandra. Savage. Savage. Also does the voice of Harper Rowe. <laughs> and I'm like, wh- whoa. <laughs> like, I've talked to Greg, and Greg's known Zara for a long time. And they met, th- and we're going to get her on the show to talk about it, how they met and whatnot. But <laughs> Greg was like, yeah, I mean, there's not every voice actor you literally write parts for. She's brilliant. And now we're seeing all of it. Like her voice acting is incredible. I like there are some voice actors on the show who I can kind of pick out in a crowd and be like, oh, that's that's blah, blah, blah. Because like their voices sound uh-huh. similar. But like I did not realize that she voiced all three of those characters till I saw her name in the credits. They all sound so different. I was like, wait, what? What? You you can I mean, you can hear like Jason Spizak's voice in Forager. You yes. can kind of hear yeah. it. It's very different than Wally's, but it's kind of there. And then he's, he does other stuff that you can't tell at all. But yeah. like like a lot of his video game stuff is very different, obviously. But man, yeah, anyway, uh, we, we'll, we'll get her on the show. We got her, we got her <laughs> scheduled to interview next month and we'll we'll get her on the show to talk about that. But anyway, now just, I don't know. There's so many background characters, guys. <laughs> There's so many. You want to call out a couple, a few of them, and we'll go into a the rest during breakdowns. Couple, a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's so many. Okay, let's talk about Lenore Paris, go the for teacher, it. A teacher in the class. This may be one of the deepest cuts I've gotten yet. She's Miss Paris. She's a teacher at Happy Harbor High. She was a teacher at the high school. In the Super Friends comic, not the TV show, the tie-in comic from the 70s and taught like the Wonder Twins. What? (laughs) (laughs) I had to go, I had to look, get the name. There's a mention that she's in the Super Friends comics. They tell what volume it's it's in. I had to go look up the volumes (laughs) and figure out who this person was. You had to fall down a rabbit hole. Oh my gosh. I just started with this episode. Eddie Corliss, who's a character that Jason Spizak has like, he says freaks or something. He's one of the kids in the class. So Eddie Corliss was a police officer in the very first Teen Titans adventure where they fought Mr. Twister. He was a police (laughs) officer who had called, it was Robin, Kid Flash, and I can't remember if it was Speedy or Aqualad to his town to for like this public like thing they were doing something about the mayor uh, putting up some new law and he wanted the the kid them to come and and say something against this law or something like that and then twister shows up that's how it starts you get do it. what <laughs> they're just pulling names out of a hat all the star lab scientists in here alan faden sarah charles uh 
the 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 freak the EMT the EMT the woman EMT in the the episode we're going to talk about I think you're going to get into in a minute the EMT is is credited as Casey Brink and Casey Brink has a, the bizarrest background <laughs> including a she was a manifested being uh, created whole cloth of by a sentient street <laughs> like <laughs> I'm telling you guys I not how I expected that sentence to end yeah the street's name was Danny and he had created Casey Brink in order to communicate with people through comics so Casey was originally a comic character who was a superhero in the comic who had a secret identity as an EMT, but then eventually Danny realized, I don't know, I'm a street. Maybe I can just create life. So he creates, I think I killed Emily myself. I just see hands flailing around. Off. So Casey <laughs> manifests herself and joins the Doom Patrol. Rich, we can't go down this rabbit hole right now. Okay, all right, that's like a third. Okay, oh I just God. mentioned a third of the people. <laughs> I will mention I will mention one more, which is Holocaust. So we get Holocaust, who's yet another milestone character. So we're getting more and more milestone characters, which I'm really excited about. And we had hardware mentioned at some point uh, in like the first episode, uh, just name dropped, but we haven't seen him yet. Anyway, there's so much. I, I just got a <clears throat> I, quick shout out to Screen Screen Rants, uh, Matt Morrison, who caught a whole thing about Paul Sloan, who's the, the actor who plays. Oh, what's his name? Connor, Connor Manley. Connor, Connor Manley. Manley in the in the Hello Megan. Show. He got a whole. Th I'll go into that in a deep dive, or you can pop over to Screen Rant and you can you can read their article on behind the scenes. I didn't catch that one. I caught these. I caught the other ones. I was like, wait, what? So I I don't even know what to say. It's a sentient street. She's an EMT. Is that a thing? I don't know. If, if I'm remembering correctly. Oh, also, I those, think, EM, those yeah. EMTs showed up. What were, yeah. Is that what you were going to say? I was about to say, if uh, anyone who's read the Young Justice Outsiders tie-in comic, uh, Torch Songs, about Connor and McGann and Hello, Megan, and a bunch of other stuff, two EMTs are in that near the very end, and they're the same EMTs that show up here. Yeah. Like, they're just I like, why did, is our lives so weird? Didn't Christopher Jones call that out? I, I think, think he because so. he because yeah. he drew them. Yeah, <laughs> and he was like, I think. Wait, <laughs> I know these. I know these EMTs. Are those my random EMTs? <laughs> right, they're here again. They're the only two EMTs in Beverly Hills. <laughs> no, no. Apparently, they only they only they only don't deal with unconscious people. Yeah, because that's what happened in Torch Song as well. But like weirdly random unconscious people <laughs> with yeah, no totally. discernible things. Yeah. So. What uh, what else you got from that episode besides sentient street? <laughs> got some thoughts about Halo or anything before we dive into this fever dream? No, let's do the fever dream. I got fever dream comments. Go for it. <laughs> so there's this fever dream. <laughs> before we get to the fever <laughs> dream, though, in that episode, we get <laughs> if to the see sentient street wasn't enough. <laughs> yeah. Before we get to it, we do see a bit of Beast Boy's TV show career. Or he apparently plays a Martian, which like warmed my heart and was really funny to me. <laughs> that yeah, apparently great. we have fictional Martians in in the Young Justice universe where we know Martians actually exist. And apparently on this show, Martians turn into animals <laughs> and they just go with it. They're, and they included some really fun little like insider entertainment nods. In that thing, one of them being the fact that they include the Wilhelm scream in the filming of his sci-fi show. Yeah, and, of course they do. Yeah. For people who don't know, there is a very specific scream sound effect that has been used in hundreds of films and television Pro shows. Probably thousands. Yes. I was. I, it has its own Wikipedia page. If you Google it, you will see it. You will hear there it. There is a lot of stuff, but if you're a Star Wars fan, <laughs> I know yeah. where the Wilhelm scream is. That's one Finding the, the Wilhelm ones. scream is a joke. Oh, there it is. <laughs> the Star Wars, it's one of the stormtroopers that's falling down the shaft when Luke and Leia are trying to get out uh, <laughs> is when he falls. It's a very distinct scream. And also the fact that the villains on this show are called Clamulons, and they're just clam aliens with masks that open and shut 
like clams. And, and they I click. Was, and they click. <laughs> and I was dying. It was just, it's just so, it's so much. And we'll get into more. But I do before we get into this fever dream, because I keep stalling on this fever dream. Honestly, Queen Perdita this season is just, she is goals. She is successfully running a country at 17. Her style is on point. She is dating a TV (laughs) star slash superhero who's super sweet and supportive of her political career. Like, yes, girl. Girl is living the life. I applaud Queen (laughs) Perdita. Shout out to this fictional queen. (laughs) No, because like I caught it on the second time through her her reasoning for being like late to for getting ready for their date is that like a trade conference ran over like she is actively leading a country. And I'm like, that's really cool. And I like that nod. I like that Queen Perdita is getting to be like a politician in this universe, not just child royalty. So that fever dream. (laughs) I can't stall on it anymore, guys. So this episode included a scene that comes out of nowhere and no one was expecting and we all just had to go with it. That's just Doom Patrol Go and it's a lot and it's a parody of Teen Titans Go and is also like an actually really well done way to inform us of Garfield's backstory that we didn't see. And it's just... With the Doom Patrol all voiced by all the original Teen Teen Titans Titans actors. Who voiced them on Teen Titans Go. And it's... it. I was caught between laughing hysterically and crying my eyes out the entire time. I was like holding my head in my hands. And my... I literally just... I didn't know what to do. Someone no. asked me if I was okay, and my only response was no, I, with like I don't a question know. Yeah, right. mark. Like, <laughs> right. I couldn't, I wasn't coherent. When it popped up, Neil and I turned and looked at each other, and I looked back on the screen, and I'm like, I don't know what's happening right now. And then, <laughs> right? Like, I couldn't so, process it. So, intellectually, because we we watched all four of these, all four of these in a row, and then recorded for the DC Daily, and that- it actually it may have it may be airing it may be airing today today's monday it may be airing today i don't know by the time this comes out it's probably up anyway probably. we had to watch all four of them write notes do whatever 5 minutes of research we could do and then do the dc daily show so i'm watching this and i'm like cuz you know i've said it before I, I wasn't a huge fan of the teen titans i i'm changing my mind cuz i'm going back and rewatching it now but i watched it and i was like this is kind of brilliant like intellectually it's kind of brilliant because it gives a nod to these two shows that have have had this kind of almost like loving um, parallel dichotomy to each other, you know, rivalry. They've done they've done Young Justice characters on the Teen Titans. They had and, an ep- and- there is an episode of Teen Titans Go where the Young Justice team shows up to tell the Teen Titans Go that they are not serious enough and they need to be more serious. <laughs> right. And so this was a really great like nod back to that group, right? Which I which I love, and I'm watching it, and I'm like, I love this, but I kind of wanted the real Doom Patrol, but then I kind of am okay with this because it's a lot. They have Doom you know, in the bridge, name. bridge full of ghosts, and oh look, let's see Jason Todd get shot again, like you know, like like get shot not again, but like get shot, and like let's uh, well, why don't we just just for just for the fun of it, we'll go ahead and uh, play the season two finale <laughs> with Artemis crying her eyes out about where's Wally. We'll just put that in there. And then we'll go to this Doom Patrol Go thing, which is kind of like an, an a reprieve, but it's for not. a second, and then it's super not. And then I, I when I watched it a second time around, and I wasn't quite so like just caught off guard by like, wait, what just happened? Yeah, it's yeah. I was gonna say it's terrible, but it's like it's not terrible. Like it's terrible. It's terrible because I'm watching this, and, and it's it like. Hurts. And they they wrote lyrics to the song, like, we go off and die, that's what we do. I mean, that is it, where where Jeff Stormer in our Ted Cord episode was talking about Ted Cord is the hero who dies. That's who he is defined as now. He he works best as being dead. The Doom Patrol is the is the is the the team that dies. <laughs> you can see it in, in Batman Brave and the Bold, obviously in the comics, everything else. They go on they go on a mission. Time for us to go on a mission and die. Right? <laughs> like 
And it was like, it was like, it's masterfully crafted. But the first time through, I was watching it and I was keeping up. I was processing until it got to the point where like Rita Farr has a genuinely nice, like sweet speech about like, I'd, I'll take you in and this will be okay. And they cut to the rest of the team who all just go, sorry, your mom died. And that yep. was when I lost it and was like, nothing makes sense anymore. This can't possibly be happening. Like I spent a good, that like whole minute I was sitting there. I'm like, I'm hallucinating this. This isn't real. This can't possibly be real. <laughs> and then, and then she says, "Like I will be, I, I, you know, she was my best friend, and I miss her, and I can never replace her. But I'll be the best mom that I can." And blah blah blah. And he's like, "Thank you, Rita," and like wipes a tear away. And she's like, "Nope, now I got to go and die." And I'm just like, "What?" And then, then we get to the scene we hadn't seen yet. So where Wally changes the channel. And he's standing at the foot of the cliff. I didn't realize he saw the truck go off the cliff. So if you go, if you go into the tie in comics, you can see the scene that happens right before they drive the truck. (laughs) She drives the truck. Marie Logan drives the truck off the cliff, which is Queen B telling her Garfield's waiting for you down there. This is the fastest way to get to him. And then she drives off the cliff. Now, I thought, I thought Queen Bee was lying. Yeah. Apparently, that is not the case. <laughs> and I'm like, can you punch me some more? Just some more, please. And then he's just, and then, and then, it's like, I can't take it anymore. And I'm like, I'm feeling you, Gar. And he's like, just turn it off. And he turns it off. And Superboy goes, I can't hear his heartbeat. <laughs> I was just like. What are you guys doing to me right now? Yeah, it's it's a lot. And somewhere in there, we find out that Beast Boy's powers may, in fact, be from a monkey god. Right. Well, it kind of ties in the comics. They've done this thing periodically where they tie him into something in the DC comics called the red and the green. And the green is this manifestation of the living plant life on Earth. And that's kind of the Swamp Thing character and... Some other characters are tied to the green and characters like Animal Man and Beast Boy are tied to the red, which is this energy field that permeates and translates, you know, animal life. Yeah. And so when they showed that, I was, I'm in, I'm in for the shape changing shamanistic nonsense. I love it. <laughs> uh, I, I love Beast Boy. I've loved him from way back in the day. And so I would love to see a season, the next season, season four with like. Yeah. Beast Boy manifesting amazingness. He's apparently going back to being a superhero. Yeah. So. He's like, and coming back to the life. Boom. I love it. Yup. He made, he made a choice, and I think it'll be interesting seeing him come back. Also, because we know at least some of the new team members are fans of his show. Like, Tracy13 watches his show and possibly <laughs> doesn't know that he's Beast Boy. <laughs> That'll be an well, interesting. Well, doesn't know that he is part of it. He was on the team. Yes. Yes. Right. Like, yeah. So I don't know what, I don't know if he's revealed himself. I mean, he was in, in the comics. I mean, he was a full member of the Doom Patrol. <laughs> so like if the Doom Patrol's public, which they're not often public, then I don't know. Maybe he's just been in covert ops the whole time and nobody knows. We'll I'm find sure. out. We'll see. we'll see. We'll find out. But uh, that that fever dream of an episode also <laughs> includes a subplot that people presumably just assumed made me very happy and they're right. That includes Connor and Megan talking through things and that just makes me really happy like there's a whole scene where mcgann is just like so here are my thoughts and concerns right now about stuff we got engaged we haven't spent time together and he's like no you're totally right and they have a conversation about it and they apparently for the past two years have had like a system where like happy harbor missions don't happen there and like that just got screwed up and like they're dealing with it and they're working through problems and like actively checking in with each other and talking to each other. And it makes me really happy that the show is actually bothering to include that because a lot of shows wouldn't. A lot of shows would just be like, cool, we had them have their big romantic moment. We can move on. Whereas the show's like, no, no, a lot is happening. We still need to check in with these kids. Yeah. And then going from that into the, <laughs> I have been screaming about the lines, you're my anchor always for the past (laughs) three days nonstop like this is 
a concept that has been brought up a couple of times on the show and referenced like it comes up in bereft it came up in the episode recently where she is fighting her brother and how connor and her friends are her strength mentally and all that and this is even referenced in the convergence radio play that we're gonna have to talk about when we talk about the tie-in comic where greg weissman in his stage directions called it out specifically that like Connor is McGann's anchor, and then it ended up in you know this what? episode. Let's link that in the show notes, too, along with fan yes. service. Yes, and we'll probably talk about it a bit more when we do the comic, but that is a whole thing. And But seeing it spoken like this was so good and broke my heart in the best possible way, because also the way that is delivered and the way that scene goes down, that's not a question. That's not her being like, "Will you? are you okay with me doing that thing? Like, It's just a check-in. This is just something that they do. And this is something that Connor knows that they do and is comfortable doing and just shows how her powers have evolved and how she's figured out how to make her powers work the way she needs them to without going too far. And part of that is having a psychic anchor that makes sure that she doesn't fall down a rabbit hole. Yeah, for sure. And it's him. And it's really sweet. And it makes me so happy. It shows that they're so comfortable together and they have this rhythm mm-hmm. that works together. And yay. Gosh, I've been screaming about it for three days. <laughs> I try not to post quotes or anything from the episodes on Twitter because I don't want to spoil people. But I had I had to call it out and I had to tell Greg Weisman that he killed me. Uh, and his only response was, yeah, that was the plan. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Bwahaha may have also made it in there. Possibly. As well. Possibly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. But yeah, there's a lot there. I love it. Gonna have to do a super sweethearts checking in on those two kids by the end of the season to talk about stuff. <laughs> the the one thing out of that episode that I wanted to point out, believe it or not, yes. outside of all the supporting cast and granny goodness being the most horrifying grain, grainy goodness so far. And I don't think we've even seen anything yet. Yep. Um, and that's that Paul Sloan as an adult, the guy who played Connor Manley <laughs> as <Yeah>. an adult. <laughs> they're making him sound like William Shatner. <laughs> He's got the delays in his speech. It's just go back and listen to it again. I didn't catch it the first time. Oh, the second time I was like, oh, he's on Star Trek. He's William Shatner. That tracks. <laughs> no, he's on he's on Space Trek 3016. Uh, n- <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. My With bad. another 16 because everything's got to be a 16. Because it's got to be a 16. Yeah. We <laughs> Neil's got some 16 comments as well. Yes. Um, yeah. I actually, uh, before we get into... The last episode. Yes. Because I think we both have stuff in this last episode. A couple of things, yeah. There, there, were, there, were a couple, there were a couple of things I did actually want to mention from the previous episode, the cyborg. Yeah. Go episode. for it. Go for it. We're jumping around here. Um, Halo feeling sick, <laughs> like the whole episode. Yeah. Like she only started getting sick when the mother box was, or the father box was activated to regenerate cyborg. Yeah. So I'm like, ooh. Interesting. So she can track living active father box technology in the same way that Sphere can and maybe jam jam it. I do not know what's going on with this (laughs) language thing that she's doing, though. Yeah. I I don't know. I don't know enough about, hey, maybe this was a thing with Halo or maybe it's a thing with the fourth world. I don't know. But I'm fascinated by that. Yeah. The other thing was, uh, so the cyborg... Like so, Vic in the explosion. Yeah, that was that was a lot. That was a lot. I first noticed when they lifted the stuff off of him that you could see the skull, and I was like, Neil, did you see that? You could see the skull, and he was like, Yeah, I caught it. And then they like turned the camera around because we're not on Cartoon Net, Cartoon Network anymore. Yeah, uh, and it was a lot, and it was rough, and it was hard to watch. Yeah. Um, I know. I personally, I the first time through looked away from my screen and had to watch it out of the corner of my eye to yeah. wait for that to be over. I, I, As most people know, I'm a nurse. I worked in critical care. I work in holistic health, end-of-life situations. I, When I was a veterinary nurse, I would, did a lot of work in surgery. So I, I, it would, for, for me, the stuff that was hard was the emotional yes. thing. What yeah. am I watching on this? Like I understand why Silas is driven to save his son. More yes. than just, I love my son and he's hurt. It's, I, I love my son 
and he's suffering beyond anything I can possibly imagine. And I, I, I get that. I, the kind of things that I, anatomically speaking, things were pretty accurate. <laughs> so internally, and, and as a nurse, I watch shows and it, it stuff jumps out at me. And I was like, wow, they, they put some thought into what they were doing with this scene. Even the EKG readings were pretty close, like the on the machines. They're usually some nonsense, but um, they were 100% right, but they were pretty close. <laughs> the only thing I'll, I will call them out on, just because I'm me, <laughs> is there's, there's three EKG readings. One of them says NIBP. That's non-invasive blood pressure. That's what that stands for. I'm sure they pulled it off a random <laughs> letters off of a <laughs> monitor they saw somewhere. <laughs> Uh, the next one down says SKG, <laughs> which is uh, the Glasgow Coma Scale. <laughs> so it's just a number. <laughs> it's supposed to just be a number to tell people how conscious somebody is. So, <laughs> I mean, they do mean these things. Uh, I mean, these they, these things are medical terms. They're just not used in the right place. <laughs> I'm only bringing them up because I'm me, but they get a billion bonus points for not shocking a flatline. <laughs> Yep. I yeah, I would have taken people to task <laughs> if they had heard my show or knew anything is, about me is and they shocked thing. a flat line on Young Justice. I won't have it. <laughs> if it's already in the show, please cut it out for the second half of the season. I will not have it in my Young Justice. If anybody wants to know what I'm talking about, I got a whole article on it. <laughs> Just ask me. I'll forward it to you. <laughs> On a r- completely unrelated note, <laughs> I, ha- I, have to, I have to put out there, as soon as we saw these episodes, the end of the episode where uh, Nightwing and Geoforce are sitting on the cliff, and Geoforce says, I'm going to be okay, <laughs> Neil looked at me and he's all, hashtag Nightforce. <laughs> mm. uh, mm. <laughs> I don't really I was want to like, go I looked at him, I'm like, really? that's, a, that's a good one. And also, I, no, that's not no. happening. <laughs> that's not going to happen. Because Brion's 17 and Nightwing's no, 21. And we're not going to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> that's true. At least it wasn't a name involving hot lava. That's all I know. Brion does now have a canon love interest. Him and Violet are together. And that's that's an interesting situation that we will see unfold. Yeah. Because like, they're cute, but that's complicated. She's a sentient computer from another planet. And I'm, I'm trying to think, I'm like, <laughs> so what is their, what's their shallant moment? And I'm all broken? Um, it's, <laughs> n- no, uh, I believe people still talking about it. It's still pretty new. People still trying to figure things out. I think I saw someone somewhere bring up the idea of calling them exceptional, which is cute. Oh, that's a um, good one. It's cute. Yes. I don't know if it's stuck yet, but somebody brought it up somewhere, and I'm like, I hope that mm-hmm. sticks. That's real cute. Um, but we'll see. I'm trying not to, like, I am, as of yet, I am not super invested in the two of them. I think they are cute. I want to see where it goes from here. I've still got some questioning vibes, because, you know, she is a sentient computer from another planet who is, like, an embodiment of all that is good and right in the world, and he's a disaster prince and i'm like i don't know how this works out in the long run and i hope sounds you sounds like mcgann and connor to me <laughs> it, <laughs> the embodiment like, of all that's good and happy and light in megan morris with a disaster teenager i don't know okay but that's that's when we're being like that's hyperbole on the part of like Connor and McGann of distilling just, that stuff. I'm just Whereas verbally Halo, poking you right now. <laughs> you are. Whereas Halo is genuine. Like it's it's mainly the fact that like Halo is not a teenage girl exactly, and it's a complicated, convoluted thing. And I, I see. It's it's not the oh Halo's so good and Brion doesn't deserve her. Not what I'm saying at all. What I'm <laughs> no, saying no, is I like. Didn't think so. Halo's still figuring out what it means to be a person and I want them to deal with that beyond just her being like wow emotions are difficult like I want some stuff with them dealing with the fact like Brion this is not a teenage girl (laughs) that you are dating 
yeah. work some things out. And they have yeah. him be like, well, I don't care. This is the only you I've ever known. And I'm like, yes, very cute, nice. We need to dive into this a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, like mini, mini canary debrief. I mean, that it is something to dive into and to make, to address at some point. I think, I think it idea. could work. I, I'm just like still a little on the fence. They are very yeah, sure. cute. No, I absolutely. They continue being very cute. I just want more exploration of that. Also, uh, you know, the, the idea of these first relationships just working yeah. out for the rest of their life kind of a thing. I mean, it's nice. And Connor and McGann definitely had some bumps along the way. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah. So, again, I trust the writers. Like, there's there's a reason that Nightwing isn't dating Zatanna anymore. Like, yeah, it, not, every, not every first season relationship works out forever. So, let's move on to this last episode. Yes. Because I got some stuff. I know you got some stuff. Go for it. <laughs> uh, Mr. Bliss. <laughs> okay. This is a thing. So, Mr. Bliss is a Starman villain. Also, Mist. From the previous episodes, her father was also a Starman villain, which means Starman is in the universe, Possibly. which which may lead to Stargirl becoming Stargirl. That's a thing. But also, these are clearly Court of Owls masks that these people are wearing. Yep. <laughs> I got it as soon as I saw them. I got up and just walked around the table. I just couldn't, I like, I was like, what? What? And then Neil pointed out that that scene where we get there and they're, and Nightwing and the team are looking through the walls with, through the beetle and seeing everything. That's not the first time we see the masks. The first yeah, time we see the masks are on Barbara's computer when she is creating costuming for them to go to this thing. Yep. So and scrolling the, through the dark web, apparently. <laughs> Right. So the Court of Owls, for people who don't know, the Court of Owls were an organization in Batman that were associated with Haley's Circus. Haley's Circus, theoretically, was training people to, over history, become assassins for the Court of Owls to find their main assassin named Talon. Dick Grayson's grandfather, if I remember this correctly, um, somebody please feel free to correct me, grandfather was the last Talon. And Dick Grayson was supposed to be a Talon until Bruce Wayne adopted him out of the circus after his parents died. This puts Haley, Jack Haley, who I love, uh, in a weird situation. So the Court of Owls, I've always had a mixed feeling about. But here's the thing. Mr. Bliss in the comics is an incubus. So he's a, he's a form of demon that absorbs and feeds on the emotions of the crowd in the circus. He runs. So if you replace Haley with Mr. Bliss and Mr. Bliss's circus with Haley's circus and still bring the Court of Owls into the situation and he's doing a thing where he's training people to go out and be assassins, I'm just like, oh my gosh, he shuffled this deck together in a bonkers way. So we'll see. I don't know. I mean, I don't know, I, I, like Court of Owls masks. Is this it's a really lot. Cool? It's a lot, just with Mister Bl with Mister Bliss. <laughs> yeah. Um, other stupid stuff like the field that goes up around Terra and Havoc when they're fighting. I mean, Holocaust when they're fighting. Those are the same field generators from uh, Usual Suspects back in Episode One, <laughs> uh, nice. Season One, Episode Twenty Five, when they make that field in where the, there's a blizzard yeah, inside. Uh, yeah. Where Enigma is leading that weird team. Yes. Um, yeah. So that was pretty cool. We don't know who some of these other kids were. I already mentioned Holocaust shows up, who's another milestone villain. Um, two of the kids do say something at the end of the episode, and, and they have been crediting different characters in the credits, but I didn't actually see them. And one, one of, of them is French. One of them's French. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if anybody else has done a deep, deep dive on that. We'll have to do some research. Maybe by the time we we'll get around to these, epi these episode 13 in a couple months here, we'll have figured it out. But <laughs> you know one of the things <laughs> in this scene that, that made me like laugh and think of you was the conversation yeah. between Icicle Jr. and Connor <laughs> while they're fighting <laughs> was cracking me up. I loved it. So much. I loved it so much. No one is surprised. I, I was into her first. Hey, we're engaged. 
Congratulations. Just, Boom. Yeah, it's so good. Because they don't break stride for a second in that fight. But they... Maybe there's hope for me. I hope so. A boom kicks him in the face. <laughs> so good. Like people have been joking that like Icicle Jr. would like crash their wedding, just leave a gift and be like, bye. Like he wouldn't even do anything. Every there'd be like full of superheroes and they're all like ready to fight. And he's like, no, nah, I just wanted to drop this off. I'd see us. I'm out. Yeah, no, bye. I got to go rob a bank, <laughs> but I just wanted to stop by, say hi, congrats, leaves. Maybe give a little wave to Artemis and out the door. <laughs> I loved it so much. It was so good. Their dialogue there was great. And I, of course, love any reference to terrors. <laughs> totally. Oh, my goodness. But Just other- uh, the horror movie. It's the horror the movie. mini horror movie in the middle of this Young Justice episode. It's like so many nods to like just so many horror movies in general. But like there's such a the shining feel yep. when Halo is sitting behind the door and... Uh, I was just like the whole the whole house turns purple in light, like yeah. he's done something to the house. I, just, I thought it was just that he shut off all the lights, and that's how they were doing it, so that like night vision in comics is always blue, just because you can't paint a whole scene black. Oh, see, I felt like he was just filling the space with like whatever apocalyptic nonsense. Also possible. Like shut down all the phones, shut down all the, like like just mess with technology, right? Like the yeah. uh, like the father box equivalent of what the mother box does. Yeah. Instead of repairing stuff, which it can do, uh, just break stuff. Um, but but a couple things I want to mention here and earlier in the fever dream episode. The one of the things that that I, that Greg and Brandon and the writers are really good at doing is making sure that the characters in these episodes have agency. McGann shows up to help Gar, which I think is important, but he figures this out himself. He comes to terms with these things himself. It gives him the strength of independence as a character to be able to to do this. And in this one, even though Victor's being mind controlled by this, you know, by this father box, there's a moment and it's not long. It's a few seconds long, but they give Victor a chance, right? We get to see Victor being a hero trying, trying his best. And even though he is just gets rewritten again by the father box fairly quickly, there's at least a moment. And then it switches to halo, right? Because she's going to run and then she stops and she's all, no, you're hurting Victor. And I can't allow that. And I'm just like, Oh, every character just hand that agency off, just hand it off. Right. Just, I, I, it's so frustrating and having her whole thing being like one that he's like, you have no idea what you're doing. And her response is, I know how to help people. That's the one thing I know how to do. And yeah. having that be how she does this. And her her line at the end of that where she's like, I have everything I need. Like, yes. ooh, like gave me chills. Like, yeah. it's so good. It's so well put together. Yeah. And that whole sequence, like the dynamic between her and Cyborg in that scene, her and... <laughs> He's not Cyborg yet. The dynamic between like the mother box and the father box and those two characters interacting is so intense and interesting. And like they have this familiarity with each other that is like mm-hmm. so weird and Old, fascinating. Yeah. Where he's but, calling he's calling her an abomination. Yeah. Like when he, you know, is just attached to someone too. Like Yeah, well, him crazy. like this is normal. I heal people. This 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 is this is what I do. This is how I heal people. Yes. What in the world did you do? Right. Like, what did you do? It's almost like he, like the father box and the mother box know, know something about ancient rules that are not <laughs> supposed to be broken or something. Like, ah, uh, oof. And like that whole sequence with them in the house running from each other, like this horror movie sequence could have so easily been staged and shot like an action scene, like a fight scene, but they don't. It's shot like a thriller. It's shot like this yeah. is terrifying and this is going to kill you. Yeah. And that just, it's just those little switches. It's just the light. It's just the way, like the sound mixing in that scene alone, because right before Victor punches through the door, there's this moment of silence that is then just shattered. Yeah. And it's so powerful and it's so well put together. Yeah, that whole that, sequence that is deep, incredible. That deep booming thing, that wall thing that happens when the father box does stuff too, <laughs> just like whoa! It's like that's not music. 
that's just that's <laughs> just cacophonous like it it doesn't it doesn't put you off but it it hits something deep inside you yeah. the primal kind of panicky <laughs> when it makes that noise oh bonkers yes. And the um, fact that they, they don't have that sequence as one continued sequence. They cut between that and the actual, like, normal action sequence so that yeah. you are terrified for Halo every time she is not on screen. Yeah. Because it's not a fight scene, right? No. It's not. She can't it's do a, anything. Yeah. It's it's a one-sided, you know, Michael Myers, <laughs> you know, horror film. Uh, so Yeah, good. crazy. Anyway, um, another thing that kind of horrifies me on a much more subtle level I am having issues with Dr. Jace. <laughs> yes. Same. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is yet. Neither do I. I had a daughter and she was taken from me. I, my ma- my brain is running and I've got yes. some stuff we should probably put in crashing the mode, but I don't know. Something's not feeling right. I just got some bad vibes. I don't know why. Like, I want to trust her. I want to be like, yay, lady scientists here helping these kids. But for whatever reason, I've got some bad vibes. They focused in on her picking up the hairbrush at the end of the episode. And for whatever reason, I was just like, I don't know why this is. Oh, nope. Cool, cool. Cra- crashing the mode on that one because I got ideas. Never mind. I take it back. Yeah. Because I noticed that too. And was like, that's weird. But yeah. Dr. Jace gives me bad vibes. I want to I want to love her. I want to love another lady scientist, but it's I got some bad vibes from her I want and I Jeff don't know to why. be I want Jeff to be happy. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Anyway. Uh moving on to we're going pretty long on this one, so moving on some of Neil's notes. Before Neil's notes, can we point out uh the fact that during that last fight scene with uh Superboy and everybody fighting off the metahumans in Greater Bialia. They mentioned that there's apparently on the team the West Maneuver. Oh, yes. I heard that the second time around where Superboy yells out to um, to uh, Fred Bug with two Gs to Forager <laughs> saying the West, West Maneuver and he shoots. Sh- so Forager knows this. Also voiced by Jason Spizak. <laughs> That's, I don't think that was anyway. Shoots mammoth in like the hamstrings or the, yeah. or the like Achilles tendons yeah. and knocks him down like they did with Blockbuster in the very first episode, <laughs> first two episodes. So oh, good. Was that one? oh, because like my mind, I kept trying to be like, wait, why is this called the West Maneuver? Why is it called the West because, Maneuver? Because oh, because Wally pulled that Wally's... that that kindergarten thing where he went back yeah. behind <laughs> Blockbuster and Superboy knocks him over. So good. So good. Yeah. Um, so some of Neil's notes, uh, the number 16's all over these episodes. Um, Perdita's in room 1616, which was also the room that um, Jason Jefferson were in, um, which is kind of weird and funny. Might be different hotels. Like, was she in Beverly That's pretty Hills? Random. I don't know. That's a good question. Oh, no. It said it, it was the same front of the hotel they showed. Yeah, but she was in Metropolis, and they were in, it's Chain. They were in Beverly Hills, and she was in Metropolis. You're right. The Luther Grand is a, is a hotel chain. It's a chain. That's true. You're right. That's probably true. They only rent out 1660. They're all, they're all number 1616. <laughs> uh, Vic's jersey number 16. Um, uh, Tara was item 16 on the dark web. Artemis raises up a bidding paddle that's got the number 16 on it. There's just so much 16 <laughs> Space Trek 3016. Right. I missed that one. Good one. (laughs) When in doubt, 16. 16 or 52 if it's got to be higher. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Let's see what else is, what else is Neil got in here? He says that ghost ship, (laughs) everything about the Beast Boy episode has so many pop culture references, but especially the Star Trek one. Oh, the, uh, he's dead, Tom, (laughs) 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 which is very Star Trek. He's dead, Jim, (laughs) which is great. (laughs) <laughs> um, and here's the thing. Oh, actually, nope. We're putting that in crash in the mode too. But I'm not putting this in crash in the mode. The first time we saw Lobo's pinky, <laughs> I was waiting for it to move. I was waiting for it to move and it didn't yes. move. And I was like, okay. And then they cut back to it and Lobo is regenerating. <laughs> because is it Lo- regenerating? Lobo is like Wolverine on steroids. <laughs> yes. So I, I in the comics, tell. in the comics, at one point he was cut, which he can't be did, can't cut him very often. He was cut, bled, and every individual cell that was in his blood regenerated into a version of Lobo. Yeah, yeah. So now Neil is all I need, baby Lobo. 
which, if I remember correctly, is in the comics. I think there is something Young Justice, Teen Titans related. Uh, I, I didn't look it up that there's some kind of baby Lobo going on in there. I don't know. Maybe if we put him in the in the superpowered daycare, he'll be a good kid and he can join the team someday. <laughs> or not. I don't know if I need Baby Lobo, but Neil needs Baby Lobo real bad. <laughs> All right. I think that's it. We got a couple crashing the modes, but before we start crashing some modes, why don't we get into some fan service? I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC and Young Justice. Today, we are pointing you toward a photographer. Uh, his name is Andrew Cookston, and a picture that he took went through my feed. The tweet is, I was thinking about Young Justice today, so here's some of my favorite characters that I've had bu- built and lying around for a while, and he's got this really cool shot of Blue Beetle, Beast Boy, Robin, Aqualad, Superboy, and Kid Flash, and he's built like speed lines behind Kid Flash, and Kid Flash is holding the Dr. Fate helmet in this photo shot. He does a ton of really interesting and cool mood photo shoots with um, Lego stuff. So um, definitely go check that out. I can't even describe some of the stuff. That is They're pretty, real cool. pretty They're amazing. They're real cool. Um, you can check him out at a Cookston underscore photo. That's A-C-O-O-K-S-T-O-N underscore photo. And of course, we'll put a link in the show notes as well. And that's on Twitter. That's and that is, that is on Twitter. On Twitter. I, I suspect he may have other places he posts his material, but we'll start there. And if you have recommendations for artwork, cosplay, AMVs, or other creative work done by fans, please email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com or tag us uh, on Twitter. Please keep your recommendations, of course, please, family-friendly. And now, let's get into a couple (laughs) mode crashings. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. And this Crashing the Mode, of course, is based on all 13 episodes, but mostly just the stuff that we saw in here. So, so tell me what's up with this hairbrush. She has DNA. Yeah. For That was my thought. She's got DNA for Violet. Now, what can she do with that? I don't know, but I'll be honest. Um, Mother Box has regenerated <laughs> a lot <laughs> of Halo, at, including her hair, quite often. I don't know if she can tell anything from that. I don't know, but she picks that hairbrush up and looks at it. And- and they and bother to show this us is, her This doing is Young that. Justice. None of that's random, right? She says, my daughter got taken from me. I just like, is, is Tara her daughter? Yeah, I was thinking that might be a possibility. Is that a Which, thing? I don't know. Like, there's also like, the earlier thing where in the middle of the battle, she says, protect my kids. And like, she tries to play it off later as like, oh, I just feel very paternal of these two kids. Yeah, that- but that's... And I'm like, mm, that's weird. Yeah, but I mean, that's she didn't give birth vibes. to the twins and Tara, and Tara like years later, so it can't be. I don't know. Both. I don't know. Also, don't she's know. referring to Halo as her kid, and I'm like, I but don't know. she was just a person who worked in the palace. I don't know, something. Anyway, I'm just this is squidgy stuff. I don't know. Something's going on, and I don't know what it is. And it's like. Rewatching it back for like the second and third time, the scene where she brushes Halo's hair, where it's supposed to be this very comforting thing, comes off as weird, Manipulative. and I don't know why. It does. Like it, it does, it does, and like I don't, I don't want to distrust everyone on Young Justice. I want to believe people <laughs> are good, but like it feels, it feels a little manipulative, and it feels a little ominous the whole time. This show would never hurt us. <laughs> this show would never hurt us. <laughs> never hurt us. It feels Did a you hear ominous. me? Show it does feel ominous. It's it's bonkers. Okay, of course we didn't mention this earlier. We probably could have. So Tara is 
Tara. Whichever way we're pronouncing it. <laughs> well, she has Earth powers, and I always pronounced it Tara when I was when yeah. I was reading when I was reading. Rion so it's says hard. Tara, so I it's, go it, with it. it. It's hard to get it out of my head. <laughs> we mentioned that she was missing way back in the first episode. I don't remember what we put in crashing the mode in that segment, but I probably brought up Judas Contract, where she was working with Deathstroke and infiltrating the team. Having said that, I will point out who Hector Navarro mentioned this in our DC Daily. Technically, technically, we don't know who she was texting. Technically. Technically, we don't know who Deathstroke we was didn't, texting. We didn't see what she typed, and we just saw that he got a message and there was no name on it. Yeah. Now, if it was definitely her, there's no reason not to put a name on it, right? On his phone. Yeah, well, I, so, he doesn't get attached. He no, doesn't, I hear you. I don't know. I don't. Know. I personally am like, of course, it, of course, that's what's happening, right? Of course, she's texting him <laughs> because yes. because of course that's how film but, continuity works. Yes, I get <laughs> it, but I have to mention it because when he said it, I was like, well, you're kind of right. Also, there's it, it, it's one of those things where it's like, do you? You have so much inertia about the, about the expectation of Judas Contract. Are we yeah. getting Judas Contract kind of a thing going on, which would be very cool in what everybody's expecting? Also, it's very cool in what everybody's expecting. So are they going to do something else? Uh, so it's I It's like, now that know. you've brought it up, it's bringing back flashbacks from like season one, where Infiltrator is the episode where Artemis is introduced and the episode where we find out there's a mole on the team. Yep. And so everyone was like, well, it's Artemis, but it's not Artemis. Right. So, like, they could be. We'll see. I, we'll have to wait and see. We don't know. I didn't even think of that until you brought it up now. But now I'm just going to be worried about everything forever. I don't know. You think you know what's happening. But it, there's so much. I mean, because it was redone in the Titans. Their Judas Contract movie came out. Like, this is not, uh, I mean, this is a known quantity for her. And, you know, it all, it, she was... Because she had been kidnapped two years before, that's basically the end of season two, which means she is was one of the first metahumans to have been taken, which means she had been, you know, manipulated for two years, as opposed to some of these other kids who were grabbed and triggered and sent into space. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I, I on a side note on that, we brushed over it but there's they bother to include the fact that cassandra savage apparently knows tara and they're had, roommates yeah they were roommates and i <laughs> and just like i i don't i don't know what's up with that i feel like that could lead somewhere something interesting with her mm -hmm. having connections to people that are deeper than just your your villain dude who is in charge of me it's like no right. you accidentally made friends with assassins and but it, it, again it <laughs> so so batman's there and though we were mocking bane because it's funny. Um, Bane knew Bruce was there because Bruce was hiding at the time. And he's like, I, I know you're here. And I'm like, okay, so he knew Bruce was there the whole time. And so if he knew Bruce was there the whole time, then this whole thing smells like a setup. Right? Who stands outside? I mean, yeah, they think they're secure or whatever, but do you stand outside like that and just talk it out in the open about your plans and what's happening? And it just it it does it it's set up well enough that you know that it could be a setup, right? Well, now I do. Now I'm just worried about everything. Yeah, right. But I, I don't know. I Rich mean, Hec is here Hector to make made me worried about everything. <laughs> Welcome to Crash in the Mode. I'm going to give all the theories. One of them is going to be right. <laughs> and then the one that super bugs me. It's not bugs me. Super. If you think you're worried now, <laughs> Neil dropped this bomb on me. <laughs> Well, oh, the DC, oh, DC yeah. Daily, which is the coordinator for all of these teams, is Oracle, who loves her good goggles. Now, though Barbara doesn't technically have a metagene, at least as far as we know, she doesn't in the comics, since she doesn't have a metagene, she wouldn't be triggered necessarily, but that <laughs> this delight knows everybody's secret identities. <laughs> so if they know everybody's secret identities... They must know that Barbara is, is, or is, is Batgirl. If they know that and they know that she's Oracle and blah, 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 one thing leads to the next. She's wearing these good goggles. They can manipulate her, mind control her to do whatever. I am freaking out <laughs> about none of this is good. None of it's good. 
No, none I'm of it's very good. worried. We're wh- I'm so worried, and we have to wait several months for new episodes. So we're just going to be over here being worried. Yeah, that's right. I'll be worried for the next five months. <laughs> anyway, that's all I've got for crashing the mode. What do you got? Uh, nothing much. I, I, yeah. Court of Owls is happening. Judas contract might be happening. Yeah, I do. I do want to have the shout out though to yeah. if they do Judas contract. I know we've brought this up before about how there is some stuff in Judas contract. Oh right, yeah, for sure. It's not not great. And with the show being a little more on the PG thirteen side, I just want. I really hope they don't go anywhere near some of the Terra Deathstroke implications that the comic book played with. I don't. I don't want that. I don't need that. No, I, I, don't need that. I They're real uncomfortable, yeah. and it was a sign of the times, I think. And um, yeah, and we're and in a different we're in a different era. So let's yeah. just let's just keep it. That's a boundary that doesn't need to be pushed. In my I opinion. agree, a hundred percent. But other than that, but I'm what about just... what about what about Simon and Devastation? <laughs> That's a crash in the mode, right? That's got to come back up. Rich. <laughs> don't do this to me. Super sweethearts into the light. Never. <laughs> We're not. <laughs> I had to lighten. I had to lighten it up oh, after all that we stress. Do, we do, but yeah, no. I, my predictions for the season, which are founded in nothing. I want Cheshire as a mom again. I want all of that storyline. I want a wedding. I have so many questions about this Super Martian wedding. Are we getting a superhero wedding? Are we getting a civilian wedding? Are we getting both? When are we going dress shopping? Y'all need to plan right now. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) Those are my happy predictions. All right. And with that, I think we can can say it out of the Watchtower. Uh, Thank you for spending some time with us, everybody. If you'd like to join us in discussing all of the wedding plans in this incredible series, including Devastation and Simon. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website CrashingTheMode.com. And if all of that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And if you would like to support our show in all of its craziness, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. We are everywhere, or at least trying to be. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media. Especially if you're outside the U.S., we have to look a little harder to find those. So every little bit on your part helps us to find those and be thankful for you doing nice things for our show. (laughs) If you want to help us do more in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more, please consider supporting us through Patreon. For just a few dollars a month, you can help us while getting some great rewards for yourself. And remember, stay warmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Stay whelmed.